Welcome to Hope. My name's Stephen. I'm one of your pastors. Join us Tuesday, August 9th for our summer movie night at South Campus. We'll be watching The Girl Who Believes in Miracles. This movie is about a young girl named Sarah who begins praying after hearing a preacher say that faith can move mountains. Suddenly, people in her town are mysteriously healed, but fame soon takes its toll. This is a great family movie rated PG and appropriate for ages 8 and older. We also want to highlight Hope Family Night. Hope Families, fall programming is soon approaching. We want to celebrate with you. Join us at all three campuses on Wednesday, August 31st from 5 to 7.30. We'll have food, fun, worship, fellowship. Families, let's fill the house. Our theme this year for all Hope Youth is the House of the Lord, Psalm 27.4. One thing I ask the Lord, this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Check out our website for more exciting information at fargohope.org youth. Thank you so much for joining us today. For more information on all things happening at Hope, please visit our website at fargohope.org. Well, welcome to Hope. We are so glad that you are here tonight. Welcome to those who are also online. Just a reminder that we will be celebrating Holy Communion today, so um, grab your grape juice or, and have your bread and red wine ready online. So we are um, just going to stand up and greet one another in this house of the Lord tonight and just say a big hello to everybody.
service is a blessing to you tonight.
time, we will hear our scripture reading. The lesson today is from the first chapter of Romans, verses 16 through 23. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, the divine nature, have been closely seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Here ends the lesson. Good evening. It is a delight to be with you. I'm Pastor Mike Toomey. I'm one of your pastors here at Hope, and I am excited because we are beginning a new sermon series. We're calling it When in Rome, and as we begin this new series, sermon series about when in Rome, we're we're, we're gonna begin by going through about four different sections of Romans as we try to cover kind of some of the, the major themes that are there. And we're today gonna talk about that idea that Paul just brought up to us, that we should not be ashamed, that we should not be ashamed. Before I go too much further, I want to have with you a word of prayer. So would you pray with me? God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for the power of this gospel. Thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you that in this gospel you have claimed us, you have made us your own. Heavenly Father, help us to live a life where we can give you glory and honor. And that we can invite others to know this same good news. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all of God's people said. I have written hundreds if not thousands of letters in my life. I've, I've I've done tens of thousands of note cards within my life. I, I've written here, there, and, and, and everywhere, and I know that most of those letters were important, but there's only a few that I can clearly remember, and only a few that I can remember from long ago. Let me tell you about the occasion of one of those letters. It was early May of 1995, and I thought it was important to write to my grandfather. You see, about that time, we were getting ready as a nation to celebrate the Victory in Europe Day, the 50th anniversary of the Victory in Europe Day. And my grandfather was in the Army Air Corps, and I wanted to thank him for his service that he spent over in France, flying over Germany. And I think the the part of the reason why I remember so much about that particular letter or taking time to, to write is he gave me a response And in his response, he did not take that glory unto himself. But instead what he did is he pointed to Jesus Christ, the one who healed him of the wounds that he had from war, both physically and emotionally. The occasion so often reminds us of the very purpose of the letter. And that's what we need to start thinking about when we read the book of Romans. I'm calling it a book of Romans, but the literary form that the book of Romans is, it's a letter. It really is a letter. It's a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians who were in the city of Rome. And he did so on the occasion of two different things. The first occasion is simply this. He wants to introduce himself to the Christians who are in Rome. He has not yet been there. He hasn't been there yet, and he has plans to use Rome as a staging base as he goes about and does ministry all over the course of Europe, specifically as he's thinking about going to Spain. 
as he's introducing himself, the other thing that he wants to accomplish and that he spends really most of the letter on is really trying to talk about church unity. What unifies a church? What unifies a congregation? What makes us one? You see, there was a, a, a problem going on in the church in Rome. There are really two types of Christians that we begin to read about here. Some of those Christians come from the Jewish ethnic background. They were religious ethnic Jews. They knew and practiced the Torah. They, they, they basically shared the same history that Jesus shared. And then there were other Christians who were Gentile Christians. Frankly, if we were to classify most of us who are here, you would be considered Gentiles. These are Christians who did not come from a Jewish background at all. They didn't know the Torah. They didn't know the law. They didn't know the religious practices of the Jewish people. And so sometimes these religious practices would become a source of contention between the two. Paul lives in the nexus of those two worlds. He is a Jew, but he's also a Roman citizen. He understands the Jewish world inside and out, and he understands the Gentile world inside and out. And even more importantly than knowing those two cultures, he knows Jesus. He has met Jesus, and he wants to help set these congregations straight in understanding what brings about Christian unity. The first thing that he does when he begins talking about, I shouldn't say the first thing, the first thing that we're going to deal about when he begins talking about Christian unity is this, that we're going to deal with and we're going to talk about, he, he talks about that Christian unity comes from a place of that we all share in the fall. We all share in the fall. We're all broken. People from Jewish backgrounds, they're broken. People from Gentile backgrounds, they are broken. We are all broken. In verse 18, he begins to pick up that idea very powerfully. The wrath of God is being revealed in heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of the people, uh, the people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Okay, a lot of you might have heard those words and thought about, oh, those dastardly people out there. That's not it at all. This is a confessional document. This is confessional writing. What he is trying to say is all people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In fact, he will write those very words later on in the third chapter of Romans. And that's where he's getting at. We are all broken, fallen people who suffer from the wrath of God. Wrath of God. That sounds terrible, and it is. Wrath for Paul really wasn't an idea of emotion. But from what I've read, it's more like this. Wrath of God is consequence. Every action has a consequence to it. And because we all share in the fall, all, because we all share in the brokenness of this world, we all have the same consequences with, that, that result. Let's think about this from a biblical standpoint. What Paul is really getting at here is the Garden of Eden. He's getting at the book of Genesis. He's getting at basically the very first chapters in the entire Bible where Adam and Eve are given a garden. They are given everything, and yet they're asked to do, to ask not to do one thing. Don't eat from that particular tree. Don't eat from that tree. That tree is mine, God is saying. That's one I don't want you to eat from. And what do they do? They eat from the tree. They take of the fruit. And all of a sudden, all of humanity, of yesteryear, of today, and of the generations that are to come, suffer from a broken relationship with God. In Paul's words that he's using here in Romans, this is really the godlessness that he's writing about. This is the godlessness that we end up facing. And when we have godlessness, when God is not present in our lives, sin and death reign. I think he realized that we're all suffering now from the wrath of God. 
not only do we know sin and death reign within our own lives, but all of a sudden then the brokenness of life expands beyond our relationship with God, but begins to impact the relationships that we have with one another. That's what we call wickedness. That's what Paul is using, that word of wickedness is all about. It's that brokenness between people. Again, let's think biblically, because that's who we have to be as Christian people. We have to think biblically. Um, The very first brokenness between people comes right out of Adam's mouth. God approaches Adam. Adam, why are you hiding from me? Did you eat of that fruit? And what is the first thing Adam says? That woman you gave me. (laughs) Guys, don't try that one at home. It causes more brokenness. It causes more hurt. It causes more pain. That woman you gave me. Let's think about the very first place the word for sin is actually used. It happens in the next generation of human beings. It's between two brothers, Cain and Abel. And Cain kills his brother out of jealousy. There is a wickedness that happens between people. And we all know it, and we all feel it, and there is no real excuse for being ignorant about it. I remember watching a Looney Tunes as a child, and two of the Looney Tunes as children run off a cliff and they don't fall down. And somebody says, why didn't you fall down? And they're standing there right right in midair, and they said, because I haven't learned about gravity yet. And so they give him a book, and he reads about gravity, and then he falls. That's not the case. We all know that we have fallen. We all know that there is a God to whom we are to worship and to honor. And yet we don't do it. We begin setting up idols for ourselves. Really, the idea here is that all of creation, the sun, the moon, the stars, the air, the sky, the birds that are within it, the earth itself, the waters. They're not to be worshipped, but they point to the one who is to be worshipped. We sing about it when that goes right. We, we love singing about this song. It's one of the great um, hymns of, of, the, uh, of the English-speaking Christian church. Oh, Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands hath made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. And sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. Except when we're broken, we don't sing how great thou art. We look at everything in the world, and all of a sudden we sing something like, How great I am. We put ourselves in the very place of God. And that inspires all sorts of idolatry. Wrath of God. More sin more death, more godlessness, more wickedness. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let me ask you this question. I'm going to ask you this question. It's deeply personal. You answer it for yourself. How have you experienced this wrath in your own life? Let me share a few ways that I've experienced it in mine. So often it is within my relationship that I have with God, and from time to time, it's like I just don't hear God. I don't feel his presence. For some reason, I, I don't believe that God is near to me, and I, I know that my, my, I have, my faith actually tells me something different, but my feelings begin to lie to me and say that God doesn't care, that God doesn't want you around. That, that It's a hard place to be. Or maybe it's when we get our priorities all mixed up. And even the most godly, even the most chosen people, this too can become a problem. 
There's another book in the Bible. It's called Ecclesiastes. That too is very much a, a letter or an instruction book to, to the young men of Israel. We, we believe it was actually written by Solomon. In the book itself, it, he actually describes himself as the teacher. And well, one of the reasons why we think it's really Solomon is, is because Solomon was king and he had everything he po- could possibly want. He had prestige. All of the world was coming to see this guy and to listen to him. Wow. He had power. He was the king of Israel. He had wealth. He was the one who built the temple, and that took seven years to build this grand, glorious temple. Then you know what he did? He built his home. You know how long it took him to build his home? 14 years. Started getting his priorities mixed up. And then let's just say he had troubles with marriage. 700 wives, 300 concubines. He had troubles. And in all of this with wealth, power, prestige, and everything else that uh, all the desires a person could want, he breaks down and he has an existential moment. And he says, all of that is meaningless. All of that is meaningless. All of us, even the most godly, can get our priorities really mixed up. And we can begin to worship the idols that our hearts concoct. Not only can we experience the godlessness of the world in those ways, we also then experience the wickedness that either we do to others or we experience the wickedness that happens when that others do to us. Think about the broken relationships that you have in your own life. Think about the family feuds. Many of us struggle with a divorce. Our lives are broken. This is where Paul begins talking about what unites the church. Because he's saying, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us, every single person shares in the fall. But God does not leave you there. No, God will not leave you there in the brokenness. That's not what God wants. We have a God of love. We have a God of mercy. We have a God who's there to reach out to humankind. We have a God who wants to set things right. And so he begins to do that through, the, through, through, through Israel, yes, through the Jewish people, yes, but, but ultimately through his son, Christ Jesus. Let me read to you from some of the Bible. I'm going to read from a slightly different translation that you just heard, but but hear about it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is God's saving power for everyone. Did you hear that? This gospel is for you. It's the saving power that will take you out of the fall for everyone who believes, for first the Jew and then also the Greek, for in, the, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. Let me, let me say this, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ saves you. Let me say that again, the faithfulness of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is what takes you out of the fall. It's because of Jesus' faithfulness of going to the cross. And Jesus goes to that cross so that he can remove that, that deep sin, not just all the little stuff we do, but that deep condition of sin far away from you so that you and I can live a life with our Father in heaven that we can live in unity with this creator who made us and sustains us. The faithfulness of Jesus that was brought about on Calvary, it saves you and me. And Jesus' faithfulness then inspires our faith. It's a dance. Jesus' faithfulness 
His obedience to the cross inspires me to be faithful. If I have a God who loves us so much that he would die for us and promise to take us to be with him just as he has been raised from the dead, I will hold on to this Christ. And I and we and Paul will not be ashamed. We will not be ashamed. In Christ, his cross and his empty tomb, in that you will never be ashamed. You have the victory over sin and death. Paul was not ashamed to walk into a culture of people who did not yet know Jesus. You too have that same victory fundamentally this verse verse 16 this letter as a whole and the gospel that it talks about this jesus and including this congregation we are about living out these words i am not ashamed in other words i am not ashamed leads to us to reach out to people so let me ask you this how can you live out this gospel in your own life how can you reach out to those who do not yet know jesus I, I know it's kind of like this. Um, for decades, the church has done this. Uh, we've said, invite someone to church. And I want you to do that. I want you to invite people to church. But, but lately in our culture, that's getting more and more difficult because people are becoming a little more upset, crunchy, crispy, however we want to call it. So maybe before just blindly inviting that person you just met to church, do this first. Invite them over for dinner. Invite them out for coffee. Take them out to lunch. Make sure you tip your server well. Invite them into a relationship with you so that in that relationship you living out Jesus as best you can they'll be open to the invitation to know who this Jesus is you'll be praying for him through this process of getting to know them you pray for him because you care about him you're building a relationship with him of course and so you're lifting him up in prayer God will show you that right time to to invite them to something, maybe, maybe a Bible study, and then maybe to worship. Whatever it might be, and however this goes, I want each and every one of you to know that you need not be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for it is the power of God that's bringing salvation to everyone who believes. And because we're not ashamed, we can live a life of invitation, of real relationships, helping all people, encouraging all people, inviting all people to know the love of Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you. I thank you and I praise you for, for the empty tomb of Jesus where we need not be ashamed. Heavenly Father, help us to be people of outreach and invitation, building real relationships with people around us so that they too will know the goodness that you have come to bring. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And as Pastor Mike just talked about that mission and ministry to encourage all people to know the love of Jesus Christ, we're going to invite our ushers forward this evening and just we want to say thank you so much for your gifts that go towards that mission. Let's sing together. Thank you, ushers. Christ alone, my hope is found. 
This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease. My comfort, my all in all, here in the love of Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we pray for those who we know are in need and we also lift up to you the joys of this world. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we especially pray for those who grieve. We lift up to you Tracy and Howard at the death of her father. We pray for the family of Ralph Van Horn. We pray for Christy and Rick at the death of her mother. We pray for Linda at the death of her brother, the family of Neil B. Johnson, and for the family of Brian Jacobson. We pray for Bruce and Jean at the death of his father. Heavenly Father, give them all that they need at this time and work through us to bring comfort and hope to these families. Heavenly Father, we also come before you and we pray for those who have been in the hospital and we lift up them to you so that they would receive your care and receive healing in mind and body and spirit. We pray that you would draw near to 
Kristen and Greg and Jane, Dolores and Susan. Heavenly Father, we also pray for the the people of Kentucky and and, and lift up the, the disaster that's going on there to you so that they might have their lives restored and restored soon. And Heavenly Father, as we look across not only that type of disaster, we look across the disasters that we have caused. Heavenly Father, we pray for the people of Ukraine. May the violence of war end. and May they have peace in their country. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we, we also give you thanks. Thank you for a son born to Katie and Jared. And thank you for the gift of baptism where you claim us with the promise of Jesus Christ. And so on this week, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit powerfully in Neely's life. And that as she is baptized, she would never walk alone. And that you would always be with her, ahead of her, beside her, and behind her. All these prayers we pray in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said. We remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he took bread and he gave thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. It is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it for all to drink, saying this cup is a new covenant in my blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Would you pray with me our Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen few notes about communion. One is all of you are welcome to come and receive the body and blood of our risen Lord and Christ Jesus, our Savior. If again, if you're home, um, please take communion with us and know that you're receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ at home. This is the blood, body and blood of Jesus Christ given and shed for you. For those of you coming forward, come forward as the ushers direct. And I want you to know this, there are several options available for you at the communion table. Um, the first is this. If you need a gluten-free wafer, please ask your server, and one will be provided to you. The second of all is if you need to stay away from wine, we have grape juice available. Grape juice is available at both stations. The grape juice is a light-colored liquid. It is white grape juice. Um, and again, please ask your server for the white grape juice if that is your need and desire. With that being said, we're our communion servers. Please come forward at this time, and we're ushers direct people forward.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus strengthen you and keep you in his grace today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. I want to thank all of you for worshiping God here at Hope on this day. Here at Hope, membership matters. It matters because we are better when we're together to encourage all people to know the love of Jesus. If you want to know more about becoming a member, uh, Tron is at the back desk, and she'd love to have a chance to help you and direct you in how you can take those steps into doing that. With that being said, I would want to invite you to stand as you're able, and I want to speak these words to you. They come to us from the book of Romans in the 15th chapter. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus is waiting, God so loved.